morning, everyone. We might kick off. There's a few people still joining us, but we've got a lot to share with you today. Um, so welcome to the fortnightly IAB webinar. Um, for those who have joined us before, welcome back for the new ones. Hope you enjoy it. There is an archive of all the webinars we've done over the last 13 months um, up on the IAB website. So pretty much anything you want to know about digital advertising, you should find something that will um, tickle your fancy. Can you um, hear me? Okay. Um, Tip will um, is in the background running, running a show and we'll share links as we go through for anything. We will be sharing this presentation and the recording afterwards. So don't feel like you have to madly take notes. Um, we've got a really jam packed agenda. So we're going to leave any questions to the end, but feel free during the presentations as you think of different questions, different comments, et cetera, to pop them up, pop them into the Q and A box and we'll, we'll try and get through as many of them as we can um, at, the, at the end of the session. Um, Programmatic digital at home is, is one of the hottest topics at the moment. Um, and we're ably, um, able to bring you a whole lot of information um, through our relatively new, I think it's been around for sort of a year or so now, um, digital at home task force uh, with a really great broad mix of different, um, different media and marketing companies that are part of that task force, very passionate around um, driving this part of the industry forward in a healthy and um, sustainable way. So um, they have published and run different webinars and glossaries, et cetera, over the last year. There is a list of resources, which again, will be shared with you that have come out of this, this wonderful group today. Um, I have got the task of um, running the slide deck today. We have got lots of different presentations, so I will do my best to be a perfect Adriana Exanitis, but the, the team have given me the task of builds and tricky things. So please be, please be a little bit forgiving. We thought it was easier than um, trying to get everyone to share their screen. So line up for today, uh, we've got a cast of, of, of nearly thousands, uh, but a really amazing group of industry leaders um, from media owner, tech, um, agency and advertiser. And the, the exciting thing about today is we're going to show you some real examples. Um, so when, for those of you who joined the um, Digital at Home webinar last year, there was a lot of instruction on, on how to, you know, how the industry was growing. Um, and we're so pleased that this time around, we can really show you some great case studies and great examples. Um, that's enough for me, because as you can see, we've got a lot to get through. Um, I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Ben Allman, who is not only the sales director of uh, Broadsign locally, but is also the elected chair of the of the task force and working group. So I'm going to hand over to you, Ben, to take it away. Thank you for the, the warm introduction, Gay, and thanks for handling the slide transitions as well. I, I definitely don't envy you. Um, thanks very much for joining us, everyone. As, as Gay mentioned, we've got a, a massive lineup of speakers today. This is kind of like, I guess, Woodstock for, for programmatic digital out of home webinars. So um, I'm going to keep my bit very quick. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention, um, our programmatic digital out of home state of the nation industry survey, which is going to be made available following today's webinar. It's a super quick and simple survey. It'll take you no longer than five minutes to fill out. And it's for media agencies, marketers, uh, demand side platforms and agencies to I suppose better understand your experiences to date and your future plans with regards to programmatic digital out of home advertising. This will be the, the IAB's first programmatic digital out of home survey specifically for, for Australia. And it's gonna play a major role, I suppose, in, in informing our approach to things like education, uh, training and other initiatives in the space. And as a survey participant, not only will you receive the key findings of the survey, you'll also go in the draw to win one of two $500 FPOS gift, gift cards, sorry. So well worth your time. And we certainly encourage you to, to get involved in that. And the, um, the second and final thing I, I wanted to mention was that as a, um, as a working group and as an industry, I think we're all really pleased and impressed with, um, with, with where programmatic digital out of home has got to in such a short space of time. If, uh, if the growth of, of this space over the past 12 months or so hasn't met our expectations, it's, it's certainly exceeded them. And 
There's a few things that we sort of believe is driving this growth, some of which we'll sort of touch on in a bit more detail throughout today's session. Don't want to bring up the COVID word, but it's certainly, it certainly impacted the out-of-home medium more than most, as, as many of you will be aware. And I suppose with businesses and borders opening and closing nationwide, often at a moment's notice, you know, greater agility and, and flexi flexibility, sorry, is it's something that brands have really strived for in their digital out-of-home campaigns in particular. And it's, um, it's something which programmatic can, can obviously deliver in, in spades. So that certainly helped as well. We've also got more supply becoming available. So with, um, with more and more media owners making their inventory available to be bought programmatically. And as many of you will be aware, um, JC Deco, they recently launched their programmatic business in this part of the world. And we envision that this year we'll probably get to a point where over 90% or in fact, well over 90% of Australia's digital out of home inventory is able to be bought programmatically, which is incredibly exciting. Education is a, it's a really big one as well. So uh, I guess a lack of education in this space has long been maligned as a, as a challenge for the industry to overcome. And while there's still significant progress that needs to be made, it's, a, um, it's an area which has improved significantly in recent times. And this is of course a big part of, uh, of what the IAB's Digital Out of Home Working Group sets out to achieve. So we'll give ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back there. And, um, and finally, I think, a, I think a willingness and a sort of healthy curiosity from brands, from agencies, and from demand side platforms to, to better understand the programmatic digital out of home space and to actually try it out. I think that's certainly helped to, um, to move things along as well. So we, we expect this growth to, to not only continue, but, um, but to accelerate. We believe that it's going to be exponential. And I mentioned JC Deco earlier, they're projecting that programmatic will contribute 15% of their total revenues by 2023. And we've already got some media owners in this market in Australia who are, rep who are reporting, sorry, that up to about 10% of their total digital out of home revenues are coming from programmatic already. So it's really exciting. And I suppose the, the most exciting thing about all this is that not much more than 12 months ago, which is kind of when we, we hosted the last um, webinar on this topic, Programmatic digital out of home was still very much a, a concept in this country, but we're now in a position though where many advertisers and agencies have now had a good chance to, to try their hand at this new way of buying and they've got some really good learnings, insights and results to share off the back of it, which is, which is what today's webinar is all about. And I suppose that's a, a nice segue to, to sort of introduce and hand you over to today's first presenters. So first up, we've got Senior Brand Manager at Ego Pharmaceuticals, Samantha Franklin, Account Director at Starcom, Alicia Davis, and Head of Platform Sales at Verizon Media, Andrew Gilbert. Over to you guys. Thank you. All right, amazing. So um, what we're going to take you through today is really, really exciting. Um, Verizon Media, Ego, Pharmaceuticals and Starcom are essentially going to bring to you the first real major programmatic omnichannel case study utilizing programmatic digital out of home as the driver of that media strategy. We all know the challenges uh, that plan that media planning has had historically through operating in silos, um, you know, across the traditional and the additional, the actual digital sides of our industry. Um, if we want to just go on to the next slide. Now, when you try to run omnichannel marketing in silos, operationally, it can be quite hard to say the least. You can see it here, siloed teams and budgets, siloed dollars. There's still a unified brand message or an idea uh, when it's delivered individually across these channels, but it's actually not connected completely. Because of this, at the end of the day, we have isolated views of the consumer, we have isolated metrics. Um, and because of that, it means that you're essentially comparing apples to oranges, to bananas, to watermelons, and, and so on and so on. You know, you get the picture. So you can see all of that just here on the slide, uh, if we can get the animations going. Sorry, Gay. <laughs> there we go. So through programmatic activation, these silos become more intertwined. Uh, it helps you to enable some supported um, connecting those brand experiences. You get the ability to leverage media channel impression, click or exposure data across all of these different channels that we're operating in, uh, which in turn drives greater marketing efficiencies. 
So by removing wastage and at the end of the day, you then have more consistent reporting metrics and you have more effectiveness across the overall actual journey that the consumers are following. Now, we know that channels like television have transitioned heavily to programmatic. Audio with all of its changes this year will also take further advantages of this. But the real key to why this is so important today when we're talking through today's case study is that for the first time ever, through programmatic digital out of home, we have the ability to connect the consumer experience, not just in the online world, but also in the physical world. And this is exactly what we're gonna talk through today uh, with Sam from QB and Alicia from Starcom. So today's case study is a look into not just the media strategy, but actually the overall omni-channel marketing strategy. Because you need to remember that omni-channel isn't just activation, it's all about influence, it's about consumer touch points, whether they be by retail or whether they be by media. Um, and then also at the end of the day, the clever use of technology to nurture your consumer throughout that journey. So with that in mind, I'm gonna pass you over to Sam and Alicia now, who are going to take you behind the scenes of the overall marketing strategy and the campaign media strategy for QV. Great, thanks, Andrew. And hello and welcome to everyone that's tuning in today. Um, my name is Samantha Franklin and I'm the Senior Brand Manager working on QV for Australia and New Zealand. So I thought before we got into the case study, I'd just give you a little bit of um, context around QV, who we are and what we stand for. So QV is actually Australia's number one skincare brand. Um, we're still proudly Australian made, family owned. We're sold exclusively in pharmacy. And as a business, we work towards improving lives through the science of healthy skin. And ever since I've been working on QB, I have loved that every time I meet someone new, um, be that in a professional or a personal context, they always have a story about, oh, QB, um, you know, it really helped my baby or it really helped my mom. And that's something that as a brand, um, being a household name is really exciting and it really brings it to life. In saying that, as an established brand, there are lots of challenges in terms of continuously delivering on growth. And really, that's where my job comes into play, is looking at where the gaps are with consumers, what are the new opportunities. So in terms of the background for this case study, what we saw was we were slightly under-indexing in this younger family demographic. Also, in terms of our SKU mix, we had a bit of room to grow in terms of our um, units sold in the moisturizer segment so we're really well in washes but room to grow with moisturizers from a competitive standpoint um there were have been a lot of brands coming into the therapeutic or sensitive skincare space that are natural brands so have natural ingredients or cues and lastly which i'm sure um a lot of you may have experienced over the past 12 to 18 months is Instead of going to a GP or a pharmacist to get input into um, a medical problem, a lot of people are doing desktop research and then actually finding solutions themselves, shopping, self-selecting store. So with that said, if we can just flick to the next slide, I'll just talk you through the brief of, as a business, what we said, what are we trying to achieve? And this is something that we worked with Starcom on. So I'll just read this out to you. Um, so we were trying to get health conscious mums with young families who identify with sensitive skin and actively seek ways to keep it feeling and looking healthy, who think that QV is great for treating skin problems, but that brands with natural cues are the healthiest choice, to believe that QV is the best way to keep sensitive skin healthy every day by convincing them that QV skin lotion is the best choice to suit their family's dry sensitive skin to bring out their best every day because QV is formulated to mimic how healthy skin hydrates itself to help lock in moisture for up to 24 hours. We're free from common irritants, Australian made and owned and recommended by dermatologists. So I don't know about you guys, but that's quite a lot to take in and digest. So we also recognize that this wasn't a, a simple reach one kind of campaign. There was a big job to do in this space. So what we actually looked at doing was, if you can flip to the next slide, uh, this campaign was, had multiple touch points. Um, we had creative that spanned from awareness drivers all the way down the funnel to something quite tactical and it spread across social and digital, online video, in-store and of course out of home, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today. But for us as a business, 
we needed to go from a brand that has really high awareness in the Australian market and really nurture our consumers all the way through to the um, bottom of the funnel. And this wasn't just, you know, mums between 25 and 35. This is quite a distinct consumer with a distinct mindset that we were trying to shift, which is quite a challenge. So um, in saying that, I'll get uh, I'll pass over to Alicia. She'll talk a little bit about the media strategy, um, how this campaign came to, together using um, programmatic digital at a home, and um, and then I'll touch on the results after um, after Alicia. So Alicia, over to you. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everybody. So we firstly wanted to give you a bit of a look at the strategic approach that Starcom developed for this campaign, which is what this slide gives you a nice snapshot of. Um, Starcom is the human experience company, which means that people and our consumer is at the heart of everything that we do and create. Uh, so it was only obvious that for QV, we should end up with a solution that was audience first and audience led. Um, and what this thinking of audience first um, prompts us to first do is look at our audience and think about who we want to target. Uh, so for this campaign, we um, established that we wanted to create a bespoke QV body audience um, that we could feel really confident um, in targeting. We could feel like it was a really relevant audience and they would be most receptive to our communications. And so we ended up with this bespoke QB body audience that we titled the Health Conscious Mum, which had several attitudinal, behavioural and geographical overlays within it. Um, so we could feel really confident um, for this campaign that um, we were targeting the right consumer. Um, and with this bespoke audience, the hope was that we could have most of our channels or um, yeah, all of our channels um, be able to target this bespoke audience, both in the offline and the online world to have the whole campaign work seamlessly together um, because that's ultimately the dream. Uh, so once we'd established our audience, we then reminded ourselves of the task at hand, which was to grow consideration of the QV body range by demonstrating that QV is the healthiest choice for my kids' skin as they grow. So with this being our task, we then went on to establish our roles um, that we needed to address in media. Uh, so the first um, was that we needed to have an awareness play um, within this campaign. Having that really bespoke audience, um, it was only obvious that um, we really wanted to go at, at them at scale and reach as much of this audience as we possibly could. Um, and then we also had the consideration pillar as well. Um, so so can you flip back to the, the previous slide? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, we also had the consideration pillar. Um, ultimately, our task was to grow consideration. Um, so only felt right to also need a consideration pillar. Um, we then went on to selecting our channels and we had digital out of home as our hero channel within the awareness task. Um, and this was brought programmatically. Um, you'll remember that I previously mentioned um, we endeavoured um, to use this bespoke QV body audience across the majority of our paid uh, media channels. And that's exactly what buying digital out of home programmatically allowed us to do. Um, we were able to have locations selected based on the locations that over indexed with that health conscious mum audience. Um, but not only that, we were also able to nurture the audience through the marketing funnel from awareness to consideration by capturing um, their mobile device ID. So um, through the programmatic digital out of home execution, we were able to create a pool of people that we were then able to retarget um, in our consideration phase through audio, native and display. Um, and that was all implemented through um, and managed through Verizon's unified platform. And then we just had an additional support of a screen presence in our awareness phase as well through online video and YouTube. Um, if you could please flick to the next slide and I will hand back over to Andrew. Thank you. So what I wanted to do is just quickly explain um, for everybody from an educational point of view how the device ID capture piece happens here. So as Alicia was saying, that custom audience that we bought, the health conscious mum, that is the really, really key thing uh, to how omni-channel can actually be delivered here and having that same audience that can be activated across all of the different levels and channels within that campaign. But the really awesome thing about how this all happens is, is that, as, as Alicia was saying, you know, the programmatic out-of-home portion of this 
campaign was the hero part. This was where we essentially pushed out the gigantic awareness phase. We then took all of the consumers that were actually exposed to that by um, capturing all of the different mobile device IDs that were assigned to them. Now, the way that this typically happens is through partners like LifeSite for this campaign, other partners that we have in market like Near as well. Um, off the back of it, they will actually uh, plot the exposure time of every single one of the panels within the actual campaign. So they'll make sure that they will measure all of those different device IDs at the time that those exposures happen so that you have a significant portion um, of a seed pool to then drive the re-engagement throughout the rest of the channels. Um, so Alicia, do you want to talk through the, the rest of the audio display and native pieces? Yeah, sure. So um, once we'd captured those um, device IDs through um, the digital out-of-home execution, we then went on to retarget them um, through audio, which was a run of network buy across Spotify, Nova and SEA. Um, also through display, which is your standard web display formats. And then finally through native um, and the messaging was to just remind that health conscious mum bespoke audience um, of the benefits of QV and deepen that consideration um, into the broader QV portfolio, not just their um, body range. Um, so that was, yeah, the omni-channel approach that we uh, took for the campaign and how it ran. Um, I'll now pass back over to Sam, who will finally touch on the business results um, that we saw from the campaign. Thanks, if we could just flick to you last slide so this is the money slide i guess guys so um i'll just chat through some of the results and um what was great to see was yes we achieved four million in reach across the different channels during the campaign but as i mentioned earlier we we also wanted to drive frequency to really um look at the longevity of the campaign um and get those messages hitting home one of the uh i guess the kpis that Alicia touched on that we're still working on is how we actually can retarget um, these shoppers now in the future for the rest of our wider range as well. In terms of the actual the stats and the sales, so there was increase of 28% above um, the benchmark for purchase intent off the back of the campaign. And also in terms of our sales, uh, so we had a, over a 20% uplift in sales over that um, promotional period. You will see on the chart that there's, um, you know, a peak in there from COVID, which uh, that got wrapped up into the panic buying um, for all of uh, those people out there, panic buying and all the toilet paper, thanks. Um, but the uh, off back of the COVID impact, we weren't sure whether we were going to see a significant dip in sales, but instead this campaign actually drove considerable growth on the year before and was the highest peak. Um, that we'd seen outside of that COVID peak. So some really strong sales results as well. So I think I'll just hand it back over to Andrew now just to quickly wrap it all up. Yeah. So just a couple of key takeaways as part of this. Aside from all of the, the technical sides of these campaigns, when you start talking about programmatic out of home as part of these omni-channel campaigns, it's not just about the activation layer. You can activate digital out of home as much as you want, but what we're trying to do by the way that we deliver campaigns like this is trying to make sure that you are nurturing the consumer all the way through their actual journey. So leading with digital out of home gives you the ability to connect the consumer experience across the online and the physical world programmatically. And it's really, really strong um, when it's actually delivered. So the other side of it as well is that Omnichannel isn't just media. I know, well, you can see it within this QV campaign. There are multiple consumer touch points. You have the social side of it. You have the actual media strategy side of it delivered through the Verizon DSP. But then you also have the creativity element uh, that is really, really key to this. Whether we're talking about brand and frequency propositions or whether we're talking about the actual retail price point offer, um, cash pack offer that was activated as part of the campaign as well. So this has been, uh, this is the overall case study uh, that, that we've just gone through and, and feel free to send through any questions that you have off the back of this. We'll also be releasing this um, over the next couple of weeks uh, for any clients that are uh, keen to get a little bit more into the weeds of it. Cheers.
Beautiful. Uh, morning all. Firstly, thanks to all that have jumped on the webinar to listen to the exciting space of programmatic out of home. I think from my perspective, having worked in the space for over 15 years, I'm truly fascinated by the way out of home has evolved and can now demonstrate its ability to perform deeper down the marketing funnel. Uh, this has been highlighted in the last three years, particularly at QMS, where we've uh, executed in excess of 150 campaigns. But I think overall, gone are the days of measuring out of home success by the CEO, CEO saw the billboard or the sales team are seeing it in market. But today, Matt and I will be discussing how Volvo enhanced their 2020 campaign by deploying programmatic out of home. Next slide, please, Clay. And next one again. So Volvo's activities moved away from the price focus and it unlocked the historic 70-30 media buying strategies uh, with a 12-month vision to maximize reach, make Volvo seem bigger than they are, but ultimately drive sales. They did this by utilizing premium high impact and broad reaching digital out of home formats that were bought traditionally, coupling that with programmatic as an enhancement that really delivered agility in the tactical retail messages to really hammer home immediacy, accuracy, consistency and transparency. And as we've talked about before, this is never more important than in the COVID year that was 2020. Next slide, please, Guy. So here's the visual representation about how it worked for Volvo with multiple messages on premium formats working down the marketing funnel. We've got the awareness piece pushing the brand, consideration that narrows it down to the product, and then ultimately the purchase via the programmatic. So I'll now flick it over to Matt from Hivestack to detail how we specifically deploy the programmatic. Thanks, Matt. Well, thanks, Sotho. As we embrace new ways to trade digital outdoor in Australia, we couldn't be more excited. Our recent campaign with Volvo is a simple example of how the DSP can offer another tactical layer of campaign awareness, in this case focused around specific dealership locations. Volvo's first campaign objective was to target screens in proximity to dealerships. The DSP allowed for an immediate impact in delivering audience impressions to those in the local area, ultimately driving inquiry into the individual dealerships. The second objective was for each dealer requiring its own local reach, awareness and visibility to their community. This was achieved with allocated budgets, capped CPMs and controlled pacing over the campaign period. At any stage, the campaign could be paused or accelerated from the DSP based on the amount of inquiry occurring at each of the dealerships. Campaign objective three is the campaign needed to be set up and needed to go live. And this was achieved in the DSP within a couple of hours. All that was needed from QMS was to approve the creative content submitted via the DSP for the campaign to go live and for us to commence bidding for local audience impressions in real time. One thing we hear time and time again at Hivestack is how difficult it can be to allocate specific budgets and audience delivery to a specific retailer or franchiser. Essentially, the Hivestack DSP dissolves this issue entirely. In fact, recently we have done campaigns where we have built hundreds of line items specifically allocated to create local and addressable awareness within the community. So let's look at how easily this is built out in the DSP. You can see that we're able to create different light items for different dealer catchments for a set campaign period, with each line item being dedicated to each dealership. The benefit to Volvo as a client is that they could see how the campaign has been pacing and how many impressions were being actively delivered at the time. This gave Volvo confidence in the number of people exposed to their brand in proximity to the dealership. If the client was interested in the number of impressions being delivered to their site at any hour, then they could easily see a dynamic hourly report as part of the Hivestack's commitment to transparency. Hivestack also gives clients the ability to create a time-lapse 3D map of impressions being delivered in a user-friendly URL. 
And then finally, we have the, vi we have the visibility as far as what geofences have been applied, the media types that have, we have selected, the pacing, optimization, and day parting. The different campaign creative sizes that are presented to HiveStack are in turn calculated with recommendations being made on the percentage of deliverables of that particular size of creative. Thank you. Pass on to Sarah and Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Dave. Uh, my name's Ben Baker, Sales Director here at Pistar Media. And today I'm going to be having a chat with uh, Sarah Sarafa, uh, the Client Advisory Manager of Matterkind in regards to a recent Tourism Tasmania campaign that we've run. Sarah, anyway, you look at it, 2020, as people have mentioned, was an incredibly tough year for out of home. Uh, at a time when most tourism bodies were reducing spend or going dark, uh, Tourism Tasmania and Matterkind took a very different approach. Um, how did you manage to stay active at a time when uh, borders and were continuously being slammed and flights continuously cancelled? Thanks, Ben. It's great to be here and be able to chat about this really exciting campaign. You're very right. 2020 was a, a challenging year. There was a lot of uncertainty in market and it felt as though the only constant was change. These conditions presented multiple challenges for both media planning and buying, particularly across at a home, which is normally planned and bought well in advance. With adversity comes great opportunity though, and the conditions um, of last year presented a great uh, opportunity for ourselves at Matterkind and the client to trial and test programmatic digital at a home and really showcase all the, all the benefits of this type of bike. So the brief from Tourism Tasmania for their 2020 Come Down for Air campaign was to drive awareness of Tasmania as a travel destination and really showcase all the wonderful things that Tassie has to offer. The scenery, the beaches, all the sites, there's plenty there. So Programmatic Out of Home allowed us to do this, drive reach and awareness by out of home media, but also gave us the agility and flexibility to make sure the buy was aligned with any changing border restrictions, um, hotspots, um, and also lockdowns that were occurring at the time. Um, last year, there was plenty happening, so we wanted, we really needed this. Um, it was important for the client to have that control of their buy and make sure that their um, messaging was really relevant uh, and appropriate to the, um, the user they were speaking to. So the greater control offered by programmatic allowed us to, to be a market and advertise for tourism in Tasmania. During this time in December when the campaign was running, I think there are about six changes to border and travel announced by the Tasmanian government. We were able to make these changes in platform in real time um, as they were announced. So these changes include anything from our creative messaging that we were um, delivering across our panels, as well as our targeting right down to the postcode level. So if a um, hotspot area was in a hotspot, we would, um, we would uh, remove them from our buy to make sure that Tassie wasn't promoting travel um, to users in these hotspots who aren't able to, to travel. Awesome. Uh, you, so you really did really lean in on all the levers afforded to you by Programmatic in this instance. Uh, you're able to tap into the flexibility offered to make changes on the fly. Uh, you also leverage the advanced targeting capabilities. Uh, but the thing that I was probably most excited about um, was that you really tapped into the advanced measurement capabilities um, that are afforded by Programmatic. Um, can you share with us some of the results that were um, brought about by the campaign? Yes, of course. As this was a first for the client, we really wanted to implement measurement and brand studies to showcase the outcomes of this type of media buying. Um, firstly, we implemented a brand study, um, surveying respondents both pre and post campaign um, and asking questions ranging from awareness all the way through to consideration. Results show um, positive lift across all those three core metrics. So awareness of Tasmania as a travel destination, um, consideration to travel, as well as um, user intent to travel. So uplift across all three key metrics. One of the greatest results though, was a 10% lift in intent to travel to Tasmania amongst the post-campaign survey respondent group. 
However, we didn't want to stay, stop there. We wanted to take this one step further and really understand how um, user intent translated into to action and getting people to Tassie. So to do this, Matakine partnered with LifeSite to implement a footfall study to understand uplift in visitation based on exposure to digital out of home, to digital out of home campaign. To, to measure footfall, device IDs of users seen within proximity to digital out of home panels were, um, were captured. So these IDs, um, which was during the 10 second play, so not all the time, just during the play of the TTAS at. These IDs were um, analyzed and then they were matched to IDs seen in Tasmania during the campaign period, um, plus a three, um, three month look back window. So this, um, this, these matched, um, matched IDs allowed us to understand footfall on people actually who were seeing the ad and then traveled to Tasmania. Tasmania. Results showed a 16% uplift in visitation. It's really great to see such a strong correlation between digital out of home advertising and users' real world actions. So um, users going and jumping on a plane and getting to Tasmania. So as you can see, Ben Programmatic not only allowed us to, to run the campaign, um, it also provided um, some great results and outcomes for the client. Amazing. Um, I guess something as well that I was really like excited about from this campaign and something that Ben Allman touched on earlier is that this started off as just an initial burst. Um, it was Tourism Tasmania testing the waters with programmatic out of home, but very quickly turned into an always on campaign and is still running to this day. So I'd encourage brands to look into the space, um, see what the metrics are, see what um, of the programmatic leaders is going to help with your campaign um, and, and get involved. I'd now like to pass on to Manuela. Thank you, Sarah and Ben. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Manuela Akhat. Um, I'm representing Verve Group here in Australia, um, and we're a global brand performance ad platform with an omni-channel solution covering mobile, which is in-app and mobile web, uh, desktop, but also CTV and obviously digital out of home. Um, so I'm going to dive in and talk a bit about um, dynamic creatives for digital out of home campaigns and how those can be used to create some cool campaigns. Um, you can see a few commonly asked questions around the creative setup and process we get asked. So I've just listed a few here. For example, if there are any setup sizes, which formats can be supported, um, and the recommended lengths of a video. I think they'll, they will share the slides after the call with everyone. So you can always take another look at those. Um, yeah, well, it's not always the case that you can use motion in digital out of home. There are some restrictions to some screens based on their location. Um, but we generally find that nine out of 10 publishers do support HTML. So um, if we can use HTML, it usually means that we can get much more creative and execute more exciting campaigns. Um, dynamic or HTML creatives mean they're kind of like a rich media format um, and they can incorporate either videos, uh, but also dynamic information that is pulled through various APIs. Um, just the next slide, please. Um, in this one example here for the Mercedes EQ campaign, which is their electric model, Mercedes wanted to break away from their you know, traditional creative and demonstrate its cutting edge technology in the advertising as well. Um, if we can play the video now, thank you. What you can see in the ad is um, that the creative pings and visually shows the closest charging stations in your vicinity. Um, and in the final frame, you can see how the creative works out the time it takes to get to the nearest charging station from the point of screen. Um, and that time would be used in the creative. For example, it would say, um, based on the current conditions, it takes you six minutes to reach the nearest charging station. Um, that was all activated and done in real time based on live traffic data we pulled uh, from a third party supplier. And also the roadside screens would only be activated when sufficient car traffic was detected. So during rush hour or yeah, heavier traffic conditions. Um, yeah, with that, Mercedes could show the audience that charging stations are available and uh, in abundance and often within easy reach. Any situation where it would take too long to reach a charging station would mean that we would display a different creative. Uh, if we move on to slide, the next slide, 
Thank you. Um, what we did on top of that also for them is uh, that we also activated uh, local mobile data and sent push notifications by mobile to some users belonging to the target audience that were um, in the vicinity of the screens at the time the campaign was displayed. The push notification you can see there on the left, and there's just some additional photos um, of the campaign here as well. Um, moving on to my final slide. Um, I just wanted to give uh, another few examples of some data-driven campaigns we executed. Um, you can see an example here, the first one um, of an ad campaign we have done for a uh, movie's premiere. For that, the creative was actually counting down the time until the first screening of the movie. Um, that sort of campaign can be activated at various places like bus stops, road signs, the big screens, um, but also airports as well. Um, in a different example, also from an entertainment uh, vertical client, we promoted a kids animation movie for United International Pictures. Um, this campaign we only activated in malls with a cinema where you, you know, sometimes have up to 30 or 40 screens within a whole shopping center. And with that, we started to show the ads and bid on the inventory before the film was about to start. Um, as a lot of times, tickets are just bought within an hour of screening and, you know, or one an hour, two and a half. Um, so you could say on the creative, the next screening is in 57 minutes, or um, we could also do an integration with the ticket, uh, ticketing system uh, of the cinema and display how many tickets are actually left to buy to really motivate people to, to buy tickets. In the second example, you have a weather-based campaign, which is also showing the price using a price XML feed. Um, that sort of thing is extremely popular with our e-commerce uh, clients. Um, we could also show real-time stock levels, for example, uh, for certain products, um, which also makes for an exciting campaign. Um, also great items, um, also great for items that are hot in demand, like, you know, Christmas trees, footy or concert tickets, or, you know, think about the Xbox or iPhone launch, you can always show how many there's you know, actually left to buy. Um, in the next example, we are using a QR code in the creative, and we found that these sorts of campaigns are more adopted now than they were a few years ago with the smartphones as um, OSs now natively supporting the QR code. Um, sometimes, you know, if you or your clients are looking for interactivity with the creative, that can also be supported. Also, though, um, yeah, I wanted to highlight that it takes something quite exciting to stop the user in their track to interact with the creative, but it uh, can work. We have an example of that um, when we worked with Red Bull to promote their Flugtag, which is their flight day where yeah, the competitors fly, you know, homemade human-powered flying machines of a 28-foot-high flight deck, eventually landing or crashing in the water. Um, with this campaign, we only activate it during the live event. So every time someone new would take off, um, it would show the real-time feed on the out of home screen. And after six seconds, you would get a message that if you wanted to continue watching to visit a live link um, and the tiny URL was displayed. Um, but with that one, it was a sunny day, you know, it was a free live event and we did get quite a few visitors uh, that did go to that URL and kept watching afterwards. Um, so that sort of thing can happen. It just needs to, to be the right event or the right campaign. Um, on the last example, uh, it's another good one uh, of a data-driven campaign. The creative shows how long it takes you to reach a particular location. You can either pull uh, that in for life and just show the time it takes to get there, or you could also, for example, show a map um, or show the closest route to a particular destination. Um, something to keep in mind with programmatic digital out of home is that if you want people to visit a physical store and choose screens around the store, you can leverage the proximity of the unit um, on the creative. And you also might want to talk about how close these screens are to the store, and you might want to do that through real-time data as well. Um, and if you use those screens effectively, you can also influence the traffic to the store, um, which is something that we've done before as well. So that's the end for me here.
thanks so much for coming on today and uh, the IAB for having us. Um, with that, I hand over to Brett from JC Deco and April joining from OMD with another interesting case study. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Manuela, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so today we want to wrap up today's case studies with a really nice contextual weather targeting activation from Dulux that ran in Q1 this year. Next slide, please, Gay. Uh, so in the virtual room, you've got myself, Brad Palmer, National Programmatic Director at JC Deco. I'm sitting here with April Nicholas, who's the trading manager at OMD, working across the entire Dulux Group portfolio. Um, and this campaign was planned in conjunction with the resolution team here, who were responsible for the final activation. Um, and they work closely with Vista uh, from a DSP point of view. And also point out that um, this ran across um, some other out-of-home companies as well as JC Deco. Um, I guess the really unique part about this uh, campaign is that it was the first sort of weather targeting campaign where that the control has been completely on the buy side for us. Um, so JC Deco has an internal innovation team across our sort of traditional bookings. Uh, and, and this year alone, they've run about 20 sort of dynamic um, campaigns as it is. Um, but ultimately, that's the media owner having control. There's longer lead times. Um, and ultimately, there's a, there's a sort of consistent delivery of the campaign based on the share of loop that you've bought. Um, programmatic often, actually shifts this control to the buy side. So control, the control sits with the buyer. They've got time target. They've got the flexible delivery. So I guess that's the really unique part about this campaign for us. So we started trading programmatically um, via our SSP view in October. Um, and this is the first significant weather activation uh, that we've seen across our infantry from a programmatic point of view. Next slide, please. Yeah. So our task for Jewelox was to inspire homeowners to be able to see and to feel the emotional payoff when they take on an exterior project with Jewelox Weather Shield. Previous years we've used static out of home to do this and out of home remains key to reaching our audience during the summer months, but the ability to use programmatic out of home allowed for control over the campaign and the flexibility to be present in the right locations with a relevant message according to the weather triggers. So it was important to make sure that the creative was relevant to the changing weather conditions instead of having a sunny summer piece of creative uh, running in the middle of a storm, for example. So it was really key to provide inspiration through personalization of the message and also to ease, um, all through through ease um, with proximity to retailers. So here are some examples of the large format um, creative that was running. So is, um, we wanted to make sure these creatives made sense with the current conditions. Um, and for an exterior paint, the consumer needs to have confidence that it's going to be long lasting and withstand the elements. So the weather triggers that were chosen for this campaign were carefully selected in line with the proof point of the product with dur durability against UV, wind and rain. Uh, and these uh, creatives uh, carried over to the small format um, with street furniture um, across the network. Um, and again, they show the different weather conditions uh, triggered based on current um, conditions in each area. Next slide, please. Um, so we were briefed around a three kilometer proximity to Bunnings stores for this campaign. So we used our Jason Co agile planning tool, which helped us understand the large format and street furniture assets that were in that three kilometer radius. And that kind of gives us the ability to look at both the inbound and the outbound journey as well. Um, so just on the next slide, Gay. This kind of landed us with a, um, a recommendation of 164 panels across large format and street furniture that were built into the specific PMP deal for Dulux. It was actually a three month duration, this campaign. So um, Dulux are actually able to activate the campaign with that complete flexibility and then optimizing based on those certain weather patterns. So looking at the campaign setup, so the weather triggers um, are provided by weather effects and are aggregated to the postcode level. Um, this is integrated with Vista's ad server targeting, which refreshes every 15 minutes um, for each of the postcodes. So for example, if your line item is using the weather trigger and it begins to rain around a screen location that is included in your geographic targeting, within 15 minutes that venue appears as a qualifying venue. Uh, and in addition to the weather and the location targeting, uh, each of the line items also had day part targeting to run from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and this was so that we had control to make sure that we weren't playing uh, across 24 hours like we would normally have to um, in digital out of home. 
Um, and the maps here just show all of the panels. So this includes the other uh, providers, so Civic, Big Outdoor, QMS and VMO were also included. The next one, yeah. So across the three months that the activity was live, there's more than 10 million impressions delivered um, across this campaign. Uh, the majority ran across the sunny creative, which was expected given the months that it was live, but it was important that we had that relevant creative running when that wasn't the case. Um, and the personalization just made it, just to make it relevant to the conditions and more relatable for the audience. Um, so there was also a football study um, run for this campaign. Um, we're still waiting on the results for that. So um, hopefully we'll be able to share some results um, on once that's available. Back to Gay, I think. Thank you so much, everyone. Lots to take in there. Um, if everyone wants to come back in with their camera, we've got some questions from the audience and maybe one or two from me before we, we head off. Um, that's a nice tease at the end with that footfall data. means we have to have you back, yeah, to hear, to hear more about that. A um, couple of questions that have come through from the audience. I guess the first one's from for Andrew, I guess is probably, there's probably a few people can answer this, but um, in relation to device IDs connecting in with digital at home campaigns, if any of the changes with the Apple identifiers are going to impact the way that that operates? It most likely will. Um, I'm not going to talk on behalf of the partners that we use with regards to this. So um, if if any of the, the life sites or the NIRs um, that the clients are working with, um, if you want to have a conversation with them separately about that, feel free to do that. But the way that I typically see it right now is that if we're looking at iOS, it's probably about 43, 44% of the total market here in Australia. So there will be um, some sort of effect uh, into how that is done. But you also do remember that the way that these device IDs are captured is part of the SDK integrations um, within uh, those mobile phones. So if consent is given um, as part of the iOS update, um, that tracking will still be available um, because the actual SDKs are integrated into the majority of the apps that are actually um, in integrated into those phones as well. Um, the effect of the iOS um, update is probably not going to be seen for about two to three weeks um, as Apple starts to push out um, it to, to wider um, across the actual populations within Australia and globally. Um, but the, the good thing is that we, ha we have our, our data council that will most likely be pushing out even more um, information about this um, locally here in Australia. Great, thanks very much. There was, I think, what was a cheeky question, but you're welcome to answer it, Sam and Alicia, about the split of, um, of, of your uh, placements, I guess. Um, I presume that's your secret source you don't want to give away, Alicia. <laughs> no, I can definitely touch on it. Um, so for this campaign, it was purely a retail environment that we played within. So no roadside was um, utilised. That was because we had a promotional offer on this out of home, um, for this out of home campaign. Um, so it was felt that, you know, that path to purchase, um, close proximity to pharmacy retail environment was where we needed to play. Um, so yeah, purely retail um, for this particular yeah campaign. Perfect. Um, I have got one question for both April and Alicia from an agency point of view, and it's just I guess it's it's to help the industry go forward. It's so lovely to see a an event where we've got clients and agencies I guess excited about a new format. Um, we are a cynical old industry, so it's great to see see you guys running up. Um, from an internal agency operation point of view, what more can we be doing as an industry to, to help you, I guess, marry traditional out of home and um, digital out of, or digital or programmatic, I guess, those two things together. April, do you want to have a, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, for us, it's probably about understanding and, and making sure that the, the programmatic teams understand um, the out of home landscape where um, they've traditionally not played before. So I think for us, that's probably one of the main things is just understanding um, the entire landscape as a whole for, for those yeah. who haven't used it. Formats and rules and all that yeah. sort of things. Yeah, cool. Alicia, anything to add there? Is that the main, the main sticking point? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. 
um, brilliant. I think we've got, let me just check. A um, few more questions coming in. Please pop them in the box. We're running out of time. So if there's anything else there, we'll get this wonderful task force to do a, to do a whole article on, on the bits that are still coming through. Um, as I said, we will share all the um, presentations. Manuela, I don't think your video played properly, so we'll, we'll get that sorted. And I do want to see that flying um, competition. I think that's probably the the, um, the event sounds fantastic. So I definitely want to share some share some video of that sort of event. Sounds fun. Um, a reminder for everyone to who's on the call to please have a um, fill out the survey. Um, so any agencies or advertisers there, it may take maybe one more minute than five minutes but it shouldn't be too long and it really will help the industry anyone who fills it out from that from the buy side will get the first glimpse of results so you'll be ahead of your competitors if you fill it out um, as well as a chance of winning some money so please take the time to to do that for the industry we, we've run a similar survey for the audio industry for the last five years and it's been incredibly helpful for for all sides of the industry um, our next webinar is looking at commerce and retailing. So um, registrations are open for that now. Uh, we've got um, three wonderful speakers who'll be sharing, um, I guess, both the e-commerce and the in-store changes that we're seeing in market at the moment, both consumer and um, different technology offerings. So please register for that. Um, Thank you to every single one of the speakers today and being really generous to sharing sharing that information. Um, as a new um, channel and formats emerge, the number one ask is always case studies. Um, number two is measurement, but number one is case studies. So we're we're getting there, and um, it's it's. Um, I know you know people do like to keep some of their data and their examples close to close to their own business. So we do really appreciate you sharing that with the with the audience today. So. Thank you for joining us, everyone, uh, and we'll see hopefully many of you in a fortnight.